got some bright sleeves here. All right, I think we're in for, for a fun matchup here. If I'm tracking correctly, I think we have a Ruby Sapphire deck against a Steel Song deck. What do you think about this, uh, this color pairing here? So, uh, yeah, so this is really interesting as well. One thing I want to point out is both players are at 38 points here, which is critical as we look to qualify for day two. I believe I was on the floor prior to this. I do believe that people are talking about 44 points being the cutoff. So there's something to keep in mind as you close in on these final rounds. That being said, Ruby Sapphire uh, specifically is one of my, fa my favorite color combinations in the game right now. It is actually the deck that I would have brought to the tournament if I had played. I would have likely played the Pegasus, either two or four of, and then I would have added the Hercules and Ruby as well, the 7-3 that, that sort of deals with the Queen's Castle in one easy swing. That being said, and as we hop over to the Amber Steel deck, this is a deck that I did not expect to come out of force, and it absolutely did. It's actually one of, our, of them here today. one of our most popular decks in the metagame, and it's also been doing very well as I walk across the top tables. I see it all over the place. Very unexpected. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was also surprised by how well it's represented here. Now, how do you think the uh, Steel Song deck fares into this matchup against what you've described and what I think we all know is one of the top meta decks, this Ruby Sapphire deck? So there's an extent to which it, it depends how it's built. That being said, the general heuristic is that these whole new world decks, things like Steel Song, are very poorly positioned into a deck like Ruby Sapphire, which is even better than Sapphire Steel at utilizing that high sort of ink count and has some of the best card quality in the game. So when the Steel Song player uh, you know, plays a whole new world, it is often that the Ruby Sapphire player can get more value out of their cards than the Amber Steel player on that new seven cards. Yeah, no, it is interesting. I do think, you know, both these decks trying to build an advantage, but in different, a resource advantage, but in different ways. Steel Song decks leveraging characters uh, that allow them to do a lot of inks worth of things every turn by having these singer characters in the board. For example, you have Vanessa there, who's a singer for uh, a new card from her source return. Whereas the uh, Ruby Sapphire deck is trying to build an advantage uh, by ramping, um, by using cards like Fishbone Quill or perhaps Great Stone Dragon even uh, to, to put more and more ink in their ink well. And so in the later game, both players looking to, to each of those versions of having resources, additional resources. The problem, I think, in this matchup is um, there's a lot of cards in Ruby, as we know, that control characters and control the board. Um, you have Sisu now in this set, which um, I, I don't think we've, we're seeing less of now, but it's still out there. Uh, Be prepared and other removals. So when Nathan's trying to get stick on the board, these singers, uh, Chris is able to remove pretty effectively. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it is sort of just kind of how it is in, in regards to Ruby Sapphire has the best card quality in the game. So as you get to the later stages, it just tends to outvalue the Amber Steel deck. Mm. Here we have a, a Queen uh, Regal Monarch shifting, uh, able to quest for two lore immediately. Yep, sort of a standard shift. We have to wonder if a whole new world will be a follow-up. You know, this is kind of the time that you would want to be able to play it when your opposing Ruby Sapphire player has seven cards in hand and uh, you have three or less. Like, a whole new world is very much about card advantage and card disadvantage. You want to be discarding less cards than your opponent, ideally, to increase the net difference between the amount of cards that are gained and lost between you and your opponent. It is often not, some, can sometimes not be correct to play a whole new world, when your opponent has something like zero cards in hand and you have something like four and you might be you know, spending five ink to play it, that can be a whole new world that actually gives your opponent an advantage. A whole new world is not an, a card that inherently gives you an advantage as the player playing that card. That is true. There's another dynamic to whole new world here. As we take a look at uh, Chris's hand, we see that Chris has probably one of the ideal opening hands he's looking for with a popsicle on turn one. I, we had one jump ahead. Um, we have Fishbone Quill here on turn three, and we also have the Flavisham on turn four. So all of the things that he wants to play kind of on curve. Um, playing a whole new world on turn two or in the early game, especially in Lorcana's mulligan system where you can search for the perfect opening hand, you force your opponent to discard that hand that they've altered their hand into, which can really throw somebody off their game. So one thing I want to point out, actually, is that Chris opted to not play the Fly of Shame on turn four and instead uh, played the Fishbone Quill to insulate and sort of hedge against that whole new world game plan. Um, so we're likely we'll see the Fly of Shame come down after that. But the reason that Chris played that, that Fishbone Quill is to sort of take as many cards out of, out of his hand as possible and get as much value out of his hand as possible before a potential whole new world where he's going to have to discard them anyway. That's a great point. I mean, there are decks that are built around Fishbone Quill and Whole New World, where you where you rebuild your hand, you put as many ink in your inkwell as you can, and then you do it again. And so Chris here, playing into that strategy, even though he's not the one with the Whole New World in this scenario. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 very interesting when you see that fishbone quill come out on turn four instead of here uh, instead of the Hero and Flavisham, which is sort of the standard curve of any Sapphire deck. But that is how these players have sort of adapted to the metagame of a whole new world existing is they try to hedge against the potential play. And here we have uh, Be Prepared, uh, able to get to that quickly with uh, Fishbone Quill there, clearing off the board and forcing Nate to start rebuilding. I believe that's like a turn four uh, Be Prepared, I yes. believe. Yes. I mean, again, turn five. That is true. I mean, again, and that's one of the things these decks, you know, try to do is get to the beep. It's almost a sub game against an aggressive deck or a deck based around characters. It's how quickly can I be prepared with my ramp cards? Yeah. So one of the things to keep in mind when you're playing Ruby Sapphire and you're playing something like be prepared, you do have access to these very quick be prepared. You can play them on very early turns. If you're playing against an aggressive deck, you can often wipe you know, a lot of their characters off the board and put them in the banish zone. The downside to that is when you take those aggressive ramping lines via something like Fishbone Quill to go all in on a be prepared to clear the board and try to stabilize, you actually end up with not very many cards in hand, and it can be a real problem. That being said, the ideal way to avoid that scenario is to have the Popsicle on turn one and then the, the, the Flower Shamp to follow it up and refill your hand after you've put so many cards into your inkwell. Yeah, so here we have, speaking of card draw, we have Grandma Tala coming out, allowing you to look at the top two cards of your deck. Pick one to put in hand, one in the bottom. So Chris starting to cycle through, looking for those key pieces. You know, th this deck I like to think of as an en engine builder deck. You have four or five pieces that you're looking to get online at the end of the game, and so you're ramping your resources to get that engine online. Chris getting to the point now where he's starting to kind of cycle, starting to draw cards with the Flavisham, uh, fill or look at the top two cards, picking the one that he needs, and trying to get that engine online to close this thing out. Yeah, and we do see Chris with the... Tomatoa here in Flavisham and the Lucky Diamond Hand, All which is <laughs> quite a combination of cards if you're looking to try to close out a game. That being said, looks like we have found the whole new world off the Ariel, so we might actually be discarding those cards, which is it's fine because you can recur that Lucky Dime out of that Banish Zone. That being said, if you're going to have three cards in your hand, that's a pretty ideal three to have. Yeah, what, a, what an interesting situation here because I think these are the cards that Chris is kind of looking for. Would love to play that dime at some point here. Um, probably not a lot of item removal in Nathan's deck, although there's a few options available in Steel. Um, and then the Tamato to follow it uh, to be able to use that lucky dime uh, right away. But Nate is looking at Chris's hand and saying he has three cards in hand. I've got five. Um, and so doesn't know necessarily that he has those, those perfect pieces. Yeah, if we want to zoom out uh, once again to sort of the macro breakdown of the matchup dynamic, one thing that the Amber Steel deck can have access to that can kind of swing the matchup, I wouldn't say in their favor, but gives Amber Steel a lot more equity in the matchup, is access to the flutes. Um, those can be very strong in actually helping you get across the finish line against a deck that controls the board so aggressively in the late game and has access to board wipes in the form of Be Prepared. Those flutes can give you this sort of almost pseudo inevitability to sort of actually get some lore to finally cross that line that being said i do not know if nathan does have the flutes in hand um or sorry in the deck but it is something to keep in mind as we potentially cast a hole in the world draw seven new cards we could be looking for that that is true you know a lot of people think about flutes because they're such a cheap card as a card you play early game and get value on uh, uh, with throughout the game um however Oftentimes, a lot of higher level players use it as their as their closers, and so oftentimes you won't see it play on curved or in the early game because there's other things you'd rather be doing to develop your board. Instead, in the later game, uh, when you're able to to start um, you know, playing those whole new worlds, recharge your hand, then you play the flutes and use it to close out the game from perhaps ten lore onwards. And we do see how far I'll go here from Chris that is being sung by Grandma Tala. He's going to put one of those two cards into the inkwell exerted and the other one into the hand. <clears throat> this is a form of ramp that actually didn't come into Ruby Sapphire for a while. And then once it finally made its way into the deck list, it just became an absolute staple. And I think it's one of the most powerful cards of the game. Really? Yep, absolutely. It's one of the cards I think that is cut the most and is sh probably should not be cut the most. Because it's very hard to feel the effect of this card. It is clearly a good card. Um... But, you know, when you're looking for that last slot in your deck, like, how do, I, how do I make room for the card that I really want? You know, what card do I cut? I just need the 60th slot. People often look towards the how far all goes to cut that down to three. And it's actually sort of a big deck building decision, and it has a lot of impact. It's very hard to feel over a very small sample size of games. All right. So we, uh, we have a judge call. We're coming back here for a moment while we get the resolution on that. Um, and actually, that's a fantastic point while we wait for the, for the call on the how far I'll go. In decks that have uh, combo pieces that you need to find, particularly at the end of the game when you're building this endgame engine, um, if you can put cards in your deck that aren't necessarily those combo pieces but 
find you those combo pieces, that's really what you want to do. So the reason why how far go is so <clears throat> is so powerful is you of course you are looking through your deck and you are digging more into your deck. You're finding your powerful cards, but it's also an inherent two for one that you can basically resolve for zero resources, right? Because you can sing it. You're putting and you're also ramping, and ramping is in a sense almost better than drawing a card to an extent because. You, Ramping is something equivalent. that it breaks the paradigm of the game. Like, the game is balanced and structured along the lines of you inking a single card per turn. It is balanced very fondly on that. And, Ru and Sapphire is able to break out of that mold, and that's why it's so powerful. You see these ramp desks they are sort of resolving these characters and these spells onto the board that are meant to be played on turn 7 and turn 8. Absolutely. And I think we're ready to bring you back to the match, or at least get the judge call. All right, looks like we are back down here. That is <laughs> many cards in the inkwell here for Chris. So many. So Maui, of course, Maui with Reckless has to challenge every turn, but happy to remove that Beast Tragic Hero, which would give Nate an extra card every turn that it has no damage on it. So I'm not sure if Chris has any cards in hand. It looks like his hand was off to the side there. It looks like we... Unless we, with three cards in hand. Unless we discard it, we still have the Dime, the Tamatoa, um, and I'm not sure what the third would be at this point. There we are. Uh, it is a Maleficent Monstrous Dragon, it looks like. Yes, it is. That's a pretty good one to have. I know. You know, Chris probably sitting with what looks to be over 10 ink. Yeah, so at this point, um, at this point, we really have, uh, Chris has the cards we need to get the en engine going. Um, Tamato, of course, whenever it's played, whenever Quest recurs, or brings an item back from the discard pile, allowing you to play it again, which you then can immediately use the Flavisham on uh, to draw two cards. And then, of course, the Lucky Dime is really your, one of your closers here. It allows you to close out the game. So Chris has what he needs and plenty of ink. Um, so let's see if we can get that engine online. So did you see that flute that we, that we spoke about? I think that Chris's um, sort of game plan to win this game is a bit more clear. My question would be, is how does Nathan win this game? So despite Nathan being ahead on lore, I do think that Chris is currently firmly in the driver's seat, especially with the backup Tamatoa to start that two-card combo that we all know so well at this point of Hiram Flaversham and the Tamatoa. The Tamatoa is going to get that item out of the Banner Stone as it enters um, the battlefield. Yeah, it's a really interesting situation because we have two different scenarios on either side of the board here. Nathan with a flute on board is really, it's a clock. It's a ticking clock. Mm -hmm. um, these decks often run around 18 plus songs. Uh, you're, you're generally, and, and has cards to find songs. So you're generally going to see a song every turn, especially if you find a whole new world, which refills your hand. And so that flute, you can plan on getting you uh, a lore every turn, perhaps. Um, if you can quest with a character here and there to make that clock go faster, that's helpful. But uh, Chris, knowing that, uh, clears the board here with the Sisu. Yep, absolutely. So we, we did spoke about Sisu and lead up to this matchup. Does get a nice two for one on the board. We're back over to Nathan's turn. Nathan just having the flute on the board. The flute is very threatening. I would say flute with Nathan sitting at 10, just a singular flute is not too scary. If we do double up or triple up on those flutes, it can get very, very scary, very fast. That is true. So let's see. Um, I, I'm interested to see if we find another whole new world here. I, I do think that's something that Nathan would be probably happy to play. But it's tough. I if mean, I was Chris, that would be the last thing I would like to see at this point. Well, that is true. New world. Knowing most, that you have the pieces that you need. Most other things can be dealt with, especially with the Tamatoa. So Tamatoa comes in, recurs that item, Harem Quest, draws you two more cards. If, if Nathan plays a big threat or a very relevant threat, so maybe something like a Beast Tragic Hero, you have access to that Maleficent Monstrous Dragon to go ahead and remove it. So I think Chris, the last thing that Chris wants to see is got to be that whole new world. So I think, I think you're right. Not having that being played, you got to... I have to assume that Chris is feeling pretty good in the in this spot. Yes, absolutely. So will we see? We do see the monstrous dragon coming down, uh, allowing you to banish character with its dragon fire ability when it comes into play, uh, making short work of that regal monarch. So here we are questing for four. Sisu, not only a card that removes characters from the board when played, but also with a with a nice chunk of lore there, three lore, uh, enabling Chris to get a little bit closer. Absolutely, that is uh, that is a lot of lore to have in a character. There's the second flute we talked about. Right, so. now things get interesting. So now a whole new world gets particularly scary. Even some of these things, like Let the Storm Rage On, that, go, that draws another card, can also be quite hard to deal with. But a whole new world is definitely what you don't want to see. That being said, you know we are closing the gap a little bit as the Ruby Amethyst player, 6 to 10. And we have access to Diamond Tamatoa, so we, sh we could see this turned around pretty quickly. But two flutes is much, much, much harder to deal with than one. 
Yeah, that's true. I, I just unfortunately, Nathan, not a lot of removal that can deal effectively with this on the board. Um, you know, along came Zeus uh, is available uh, in this list, but uh, just no singers on the board. So anything that he uses, any high cost removal, that's going to be probably all he does that turn. And cards like Strength of Raging Fire with no characters on board just aren't going to do you any good. So just a lot of willpower worth of character to clear with damage there. Yep. And Chris is threatening game on the following turn as well with access to that dime. And of course, that Caesar is going to quest with three in combination with the other characters. But it's going to be hard for the Amber Steel deck to come up with an answer for this board state to stop Chris from winning on the following turn. We do see a whole new world discarding two cards for Chris. Both players will draw back up to seven, but Nathan will only have access to two ink to try to do something with that new seven cards. We have a world's greatest criminal mind there. Um, that is some additional removal uh, that I didn't mention earlier. And we have the third flute. Um, again, would have loved to have this whole new world, I think, a turn or two or three earlier. Yep, and the hand is extended because Chris was representing game on the following turn. We did talk about the flutes. So here we go. One, one opening that I, that I am, I've mentioned it twice, and I'm going to mention it again. One, one opening that I'm always interested in seeing, in, especially against these control decks that are looking to ramp or do things very specific um, in the... Uh, in the early turns, is if you can get that whole new world off on second turn, especially when you're on the play, and dump your opponent's hand, what they've altered into, right away. Yeah, I find that when you're on the play, like, doing it on turn three, you, you find more opportunity to actually dump your hand. Dumping your hand on turn two is quite hard. Obviously, you can shift the queen and cast that whole new world, and there's going to be, you're going to net more cards than your opponent, most likely. But as an Amber Steel player, I find that on turn three, you can also dump most, if not all, of your hand. If, of course, if you have the right curve. One of the critical cards we see Nathan have is actually an early flute. So while that flute is not really a tempo-oriented play, it does represent sort of this persistent advantage that Nathan can access throughout the game. And it is a very, very good play for Nathan to have at the early points of this game. And it's sort of in Nathan's core game plan on how Amber Steel beats Ruby Sapphire. That's true. Because uh, unless you're running the Judy Hops, not a lot of item removal available. Yeah, Judy Hops is actually a very, very unpopular card these days in Ruby Sapphire. Mm -hmm. Mostly because you're facing a, a, a lot of other Tamatoa decks, and Tamatoa can actually grab that item back right out of the back. Banish Zone. Which, so, Judy Hops is a non-zero. Like, it is good against Dime. It is does represent a lot of tempo. It does also quest for two. But ultimately, it's like, does it deserve an entire slot in the deck if you're playing against all Tamatoa decks? And I would think the answer usually comes down to no. But you know, if you're playing against the Sorcerer Spellbook, against an Amethyst deck, or you're playing against these flutes, that Judy Hop is an incredible card to have. Absolutely. So here you have World's Greatest Criminal Mind going in, and we do see the flute on turn two. Yep. Just getting that on the field as soon as possible and want to start getting as much advantage uh, you know, as Nathan can out of this flute. And so we have Queen questing for one. Um, you know, I did uh, indicate earlier that uh, Nathan was on the play, but I was wrong. Uh, actually, uh, Chris stealing a game there uh, when Nathan was on the play first time around. So uh, Chris on the play here in game two. So Chris notably does not have one jump ahead on turn two. That is by far the best turn two play that the Ruby Sapphire deck can have. And it is very critical to the deck's core game plan. It's not devastating to not find it on turn two, but you are actually extremely likely to find it uh, by turn two. I believe you're... 67%, uh, that's not counting, you know, some other potential draw effects that you could have on the turns that don't matter, like turn one. So turn one, you could cast Develop Your Brain, or you could play Popsicle. Actually increases to be over 70% to find a, uh, a one jump. a small number. Yeah, a one jump ahead if you are actually searching for it. So that, that's counting, like, looking at 15 or 16 cards, I believe. So it, the deck, I, so the reason why I bring this up is I remember there was a point when I was practicing against Ruby Sapphire, and I started to formulate my game plan as the Ruby Amethyst player. I said, okay, well, if my opponent doesn't have one jump ahead, I can do this, 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 and this. And I shortly found out that my opponent had one jump ahead every, every single time. time. <laughs> <laughs> so it is, uh, it is very, very consistent. That is true. Perhaps he didn't have the one jump ahead, but he has some of the other early pieces that he's looking for, including the Hiram Flavisham on turn four, uh, enabling him to get his card draw going. I did choose to, to brawl there that queen. The queen on her own, uh, not a terribly uh, scary card, but able to shift into the queen regal monarch and sing whole new world, so always a threatening presence on the board. Absolutely, and I think that was a good heads-up play as well. There's not a lot of other things you're doing on turn three as a Ruby, Ruby Sapphire player. So Ruby Sapphire as a deck often looks to not play uh, three ink cards because it just wants to be casting one jump ahead every single time. So it, it's more of a one-two-four kind of deck. 
Um, that being said, Brawl is the answer for Diablo, so it's going to be in your deck. And of course, these uh, a lot of these Ruby Sapphire decks have started to include Pegasus as a way to deal with Diablo as well, but also to have more characters on board to deal with the Queen's Castle and to insulate against effects that would make you banish one of your characters like Lady Tremaine or Bee King Undisputed. Absolutely. So let's see, Nathan thinking this through. Uh, Inks, Bare Necessities plays. Oh, interesting. He's a cheap character that quests for two there. Yeah. Has not been getting too much value out of the flute quite yet. Did opt to um, ink at bare necessities, which would have allowed the flute to be activated, but something to keep in mind. I think I do maybe see a whole new world in hand as well. It is, and I think that is one of the considerations to playing the flute early is, you know, there, unlike with the Tamatoa, there's no way to recur your items uh, in this list. So if you're discarding your flutes, which is one of the cards that you need to close out the game to the whole new world, it doesn't feel great. So you'd like to get that on the board before you start cycling your hand. I just want to talk about some decisions that Chris is making. So we've seen Chris ink, um, ink the second Flaversham, um, and you see him off to play of the Fishbone Quill. This is, once again, I believe Chris is looking to insulate against the possibility of Nathan having a whole new world and is opting to not, you know, prioritize draw above everything else, which is sometimes what you do as a Ruby Sapphire player, and is opting to try to utilize the cards in hand before they're potentially discarded. Yeah, no, absolutely. He wants to be able to use, so what you're saying is he wants to be able to use, uh, make more use of his hand if it gets cycled than his opponent. And so the more ink you have, the better you can do two, three, four things where your opponent can only do one. Yep, and we just want to use those cards at hand before they are discarded. Fundamentally, that is kind of what we're trying to do. Because yes. if we do just prioritize our draw engine, which is very standard Ruby Sapphire sort of game plan, um, where your opponent is going to recognize that, see that we have that many cards in hand, and they're gonna, they will in turn prioritize playing a whole new world and increasing that net, uh, that net differential in cards. And here we see the whole new world played, and we have a very different game here than we did the last game with two flutes on board, kind of in the mid game here, a whole new world being played, recharging those songs uh, and those cards in Nathan's hand. So, um, definitely helpful for Chris. As you pointed out, Chris insulating himself a little bit, getting the Flavisham and some extra ink in the inkwell. But Nathan probably feeling not too bad about where he is with two flutes on the board oh, and a handful sure. of songs. Yeah, if I was Chris, I would be a little bit afraid in this position. Two flutes is very scary to have out early in this game. And I know that we're not early in terms of structure, but the, the ink parity is actually quite close, with Nathan being on five ink, and it looks like Chris is on six ink. We also have complete parity in terms of the cards in hand, because we just cast a whole new world. Both players have seven. And Nathan is ahead on board. So I would say that Nathan is undeniably in a winning position right now. Yeah, absolutely. Now, we are reaching that critical uh, turn seven here, though. We all know it becomes available on turn seven, and we do see a be prepared in hand. Uh, it's not turn seven. It's, it's seven ink available. Um, but uh, Chris, with that Be Prepared available, able to clear out some of those singers um, and forcing Nathan to play songs uh, using his ink. So um, attempting play here, what do you think? It's tough. It's a really tough decision because I don't see any more draw in Chris's hand. So you will have to... Um, I guess you can get a little bit of value out of your Hiram here because you can quest to do Hiram, actually ink with the Fishbone Quill, so you get out of that quest, and then go ahead and draw two more cards. I would be comfortable be prepping that. If there was no Fishbone Quill on the field, I think it gets a little bit more interesting potentially um, because you can quickly run out of cards. That being said, it's a very threatening board state. I know that we're just looking at you know, five quests, but that is a lot at this point in the game, and that queen can be shifted. And, of course, the, the ability to sing is very threatening with double flute on the board. Absolutely. And so we did draw into a Maui. It's a card that he could use instead to remove that aerial spectacular singer. But you do leave a three-cost character on the board then, uh, which is able to sing some smaller songs um, and also represents two lore by herself. Okay, we see Chris counting up here, and that looks to be seven. It is. So we're going to see that be prepared come through. Get those singers off. Get that spectacular singer off the board. So does Chris have access to more draw off the back of this? think that the answer prior to develop your brain was effectively no to have access to how far I'll go. But I saw here in my hand, but no item. So I think that is what Chris is looking for is the item on the back end. And Chris really needs to. So the thing about flutes is they are, you represent a bit of inevitability, right? You know, there is a critical maximum of songs in this deck. And Nathan is just going to kind of keep activating those of the game. So while Chris does need to prioritize draw and prioritize card advantage, also needs to get on the board and start questing, um, questing himself. 
Yeah, it is challenging. You know, Nathan, I think what he's trying to do, he obviously wants to sing a song a turn, but also really wants to get something to stick on the board that can sing because he'd love to be able to sing those songs rather than pay ink for them every single turn. So Chris has to think about each turn, not only trying to develop his own um, end game, but also every turn probably, or perhaps responding to what Nathan pl uh, places on the board. Yeah, this is a really interesting position. I think it's a, it's a kind of a, it's very much a toss up for who is actually advantaged in this position because I think that Nathan is probably fundamentally advantaged by looking at the board state, looking at the hand. But if you take into consideration that this is a very good matchup for Chris and Ruby Sapphire, actually, you know, the question is there's not a clear answer for me for who's actually winning this game at this point. It's really anybody's game. And I'm, I just, I don't know. I'm kind of on the edge of my seat, to be honest. Yeah, I am as well. <laughs> Um, it is interesting because, they again, they're playing two different games here. Nathan um, is able to uh, slow and steady, uh, gain a two lore a turn, perhaps three if a character sticks around. And so over time is going to accumulate that lore, where Chris is building up that engine where he can get perhaps 10, 15 lore in a single turn um, if he can get that engine online. It's interesting to see Chris's decisions here because I do think Chris recognized that he needs to get on the board, and he starts getting active, and he really needs to stop these characters from being able to get any of their quest value because those flutes represent so much inevitability and so much quest value over the course of the game that even something like a one-drop Robin Hood or even a, a queen just act questing once, you know, getting the value that is just printed on their card is just pushing Nathan closer and closer to winning. Mm -hmm. Uh, these Rapunzels uh, are such an interesting card in this matchup. Rapunzel, you know, a great card that allows you to draw a card when removing damage from your own characters. In this matchup, though, there's just not a lot of that. All the removal on Chris's side is not damage-based, and Chris seldom leaves characters uh, open to be challenged other than perhaps a Flavisham. So um, that Rapunzel's been sitting around for a while, um, and Nathan just not being able to make much use of it. Yes, I, I don't think that Rapunzel is a particularly impactful card in this matchup specifically. That being said, I do believe it's one of the best Amber cards in the game. Mm -hmm. So, of course, it's going to make the list. Uh, you can do little cute plays like let the Storm Rage on your own, Rapun your own character, then Rapunzel it. Um, obviously, it's not as good as challenging into something, clearing that something, healing it, and drawing X number of cards with Rapunzel. But it does do something, and it is an available play. And here we have another Mulan Free Spirit. Uh, it's a 2-3 that quests for 2 lore. Uh, as you pointed out, it represents 2 lore on the board that's moving, um, that's, that's getting that clock ticking faster. But also as a 3 cost, it's a card that can sing songs like Let the Storm Rage On and so uh, something that Nathan hopes sticks around. That's interesting. That subtext on Mulan Free Spirit, is that just support? It is just support. Interesting. I wonder if that is in any way related to the popularity of Queen's Castle in the metagame why they've chosen this three drops, this three drop in particular. Um, That's a good point. A three, a three cost two, three, the quest for two is, is just good, I think, in any more aggressively oriented deck. But I wonder how much that subtext of support is relevant in the current metagame because we see a metagame that is so warped around something like uh, the Queen's Castle. It might be. It's an interesting question for Nathan in the, in the interview post game. <laughs> Yeah, just not a card I've actually seen in the Amber Steel list. I do think that you know some of the other cards that it could be taking its slot are very replacement level, and they do similar things. But it is interesting why they've chosen to play Mulan in particular. Also, that three three willpower stat line, very, very important mm -hmm. um, in the current era of Lorcana, where a lot of these single-target removal spells actually deal two damage. But boom let the Stormer John even grab your swords. Yep. And so here we have, an, uh, speaking of, well, sort of speaking of strength, things that modify strength. Uh, we do see an Ice Block come down on Chris's side. Ice Block, a card that people looked at as kind of innocuous, I think, when it was first revealed, but paired with cards like Sisu and Brawl, which care about your opponent's character strength, um, can do a lot of work. Ice Block is a particularly interesting card because on its own, it's not a very impact. So if you evaluate an Ice Block under the context that, okay, I can do, I can, you know, challenge better, I can receive less damage counters, and that's why I'm going to play Ice Block. That is not very good. I think it was an easy card to miss, especially a common. But you combine that with the dominance of Sisu, the power of Madame Medusa. It's just such a good card. It actually has made its way a little bit out of the list. It used to be a four of, and a lot of Ruby Sapphire have seen it's now it's often a two of. And it's actually, you know, some are cutting down to zero. If they're adding in too many Hercules and too many Pegasus, you just can't afford to run this many uninkables. It's also a one-cost item, which is relevant for, for Flavisham. But Flavisham prefers to, prefers to banish one-cost items that or inkable, and draw a card. Mm -hmm. So here we have Nathan with a third flute on the board. So we talked about that clock, two lore per turn. Now we're looking at three lore per turn um, as these songs are sung. And uh, 
speaking of singing songs, Robin Hood there shifting onto the board, his five cost, allowing him to immediately sing A Whole New World, forcing Chris uh, to discard his hand and draw seven new cards. Um, and then Nathan will immediately be able to use those flutes to gain three lore. Absolutely. So this is a, <laughs> we talked about the power of two flutes, three, three flutes is even more powerful. Also going straight into another whole new world into the hand. I think that Nathan is fir firmly in the driver's seat now. Um, and Chris needs to find a way to respond to this. And it's very hard because Chris can interact with pretty much everything that Nathan does except for the flutes. Act probably has zero interaction for the flutes. And those represent a win condition that is very, very real for Chris. Important to know as well, both these players in round eight playing for 38 points. If they do go 1-1, one, one, they're going to have to, they're going to both be sort of queued up to play for their day two uh, in round nine. Yeah, and just such a, a difficult board here. So, you know, we are able to get that. We do have another whole new world in hand, um, and Chris knows that that's an option. Um, the uh, Robin Hood there is vulnerable to a challenge from Maleficent. We're able to remove that. But Nathan representing two targets, two shift targets for five cost characters with the Queen and the Robin Hood. So um, Chris thinking about that as well. Uh, he can remove the singer there, uh, but then Chris or Nathan perhaps able to shift. Um, it's a tough position to be in. <sighs> yeah, it's a tough position to be in. This is an extremely tough position for Chris. Chris, I believe, needs to turn the corner on being the beatdown deck while finding access to removal to conclude his board. Chris needs those characters to not quest for their, for their quest value um, because Chris cannot do anything about the flutes, so he needs to find a way to remove the board and need, then needs to immediately turn the corner as the aggressive deck. So he needs to find some high questing characters, so maybe he could find a Sisu to clear this entire board. That would be fantastic. So Sisu into Lucky Dime, you know, start questing with the Sisu, start Lucky Dime with the Sisu, maybe chain that into a Tomatoa. That is simply the only way I see for Chris to win right now. It's going to be even off the back of a Be Prepared. I think that Chris is in a tough spot because Be Prepared is going to be a very tempo negative play on a board state where he has access to Maleficent and Grandma Tala. Mm -hmm. So really want to see that Sisu. Uh, Nathan representing 10 lore on the board here. Uh, even if we remove one of those two lore characters, uh, that leaves eight lore uh, with the flutes, and so uh, representing game there as well. Uh, Chris needs to remove at least uh, two characters from the board uh, this turn. Um, oh. this, have... What is this? Uh, this is, what does this tell us? Okay, not not uh, we didn't. We're not seeing eight eight uh, eight uh, ink exerted, but I did I did think for a second that maybe we had found that C C does go ahead and hit the Robin Hood with that brawl. And, and it's a great play, too. You know, you could challenge into the Maleficent, but, um, you know, Robin Hood, when it's banished in a challenge, draws you a card. So Chris uh, reducing that strength and removing it there so uh, Nathan doesn't get the full advantage out of it. Yeah, Brawl actually pretty good. If you can back this up with the Madame Medusa to hit one of those characters not exerted, then via combat with the Maleficent, actually get rid of uh, one of the other characters, probably only living, leaving the one cost Robin Hood on the field. While not particularly ideal, because even that one ink from the Robin Hood is super relevant at this point. It does look like Chris has a pretty clear line as a way to sort of slow down this board if he does have access to the Madame Medusa, which I do believe I see in hand there. That is true, and it looks like we're going to see that now. Here it is. Uh, so we're taking the exerted uh, Mulan here. Interesting. I thought we would... Yes. Okay, so we have to assume... So if we look at Nathan, Nathan's going to be at 14. 14 is actually a lot different than, than 13. So 13 would have represented uh, two uncontested turns with flutes um, to actually reach 20, where 14, if Nathan quests with both of these characters, is actually just two turn cycles rather than three, uh, guaranteed, um, assuming the songs are in hand. So that, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, it is. So Chris here valuing that, that extra lore um, rather than uh, the extra lore on his side, uh, gaining that extra two with the Maleficent rather than, um, rather than removing that extra lore from Nathan's side. And I do think that's relevant. Like I mentioned, I do think Chris needs to turn the corner if he's going to win this game in particular. Um, like, simply will not win the, day, win the game being the control deck with three flutes on the field. So, and I think it's important. So, if I can't count Chris's ink. Mm -hmm. But with 15 ink on the board, that allows you to play a Tamatoa and a Lucky Dime in the same turn, allowing you to immediately use the Dime. The Dime would be the fourth item, so Tamatoa would have five lore. Um, so, Chris able to gain lore very quickly... Um, if he has the resources available. So probably kind of doing that math and trying to get within striking distance. Well, I think it's pretty face-up that you have to end this game in two turns against Nathan. So Nathan is going to go up to, and this is not guaranteed, but we have to assume single song in hand, so most likely is actually going to go up to 17, Yes, I believe. Uh, so it's going to go 14. It's actually usually going up to 18, actually, I think. Uh, one, two, three. 
plus the two. Yeah. So 14 plus 3, 17. 17. Yeah, so 17. And striking distance from the flutes uh, on their yeah, own. Yeah, so then that means on the following turn that the flutes, assuming no Judy Hops in the deck, are going to be guaranteed game, which you would you just basically have to assume that those are those are very, very strong possibilities because mm -hmm. we just we played a whole new world. We know that Nathan's going to quest with both of the characters. We know that Nathan is very likely to play a song. He's going to extract the flutes. And it is a two-turn clock. So for Chris, you are faced with the paradigm of I must end this game in less than that. Mm -hmm. And it, it is a challenge being at six lore um, to get there, and especially when you lose your Maleficent Monstrous Dragon. All right, so it looks like up to 17 for Nathan here. And with three flutes on the field, that is representing game even, even with a board clear. Even a be prepared won't. Even a Sisu, which would be probably the cleanest answer to this. Now, so <laughs> it, we do have to point out, you know, I, you always played your outs, as mm -hmm. we've talked about in previous rounds. And so Chris uh, sees those three flutes. It has to would like to assume that those songs are in in Nathan's hand, but has to has to play to his outs as if they're not there, you know. And so he's going to play this turn out, uh, try to clear this board, and just hope that Nathan doesn't have a song available to activate those flutes, um, playing to that slim chance uh, that he can make it another turn. So I really think that we should give credit to Nathan here for also playing um, <clears throat> that removal spell on the Maleficent. So while that might have just been a good play, no matter what, it actually stops Chris from singing uh, Be Prepared with the Maleficent and maintaining tempo to actually redeploy into that board with something like a Lucky Dime plus a threat. So it's, it's actually very, very disruptive to remove that Maleficent here. That's a great point. Yeah, Chris kind of thinking through his outs here. We're going to quest for two, it looks like. Yep, so it looks like we're going to see a Be Prepared hit this board. And you are priced into it. You have no choice. But a Be Prepared on this board should surely result in a pass back over to Nathan. And, of course, we know that those flutes are on the field. Mm -hmm. With a song in hand. Yep, we do see the whole new world sort of freshly at the front there. Mm -hmm. And we'll point out to our, our viewers, we are uh, the lore tracker is, is a little off. We're sitting at 17 lore uh, on Nate's side. Yep, we are at 17 plays six. So one more turn for Nathan here with those songs. And then we do have eight, so we will see the Tamatoa most likely. Okay, and again, you know, we know that the, that the song is in Nathan's hand, but Chris is playing, um, hoping, hoping that he doesn't, and playing to his outs. And you see sort of how fragile some of these turns can be with... Um, you know, choosing to play the Madame Medusa on the Exerted character, which can be correct because you want to keep the Maleficent around. You don't want to open it up to the to combat. You want to quest with it. But it did lead to a two-turn clock in the scenario rather than a three-turn clock. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 